I also want to talk about an urgent matter in my home state of California that is extremely close to my heart. The San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station is located near San Clemente, and 8.7 million people live within 50 miles of that site. This nuclear plant, which is currently offline, has experienced unexpected deterioration with the tubes that carry radioactive water in the plant's new steam generators. This situation could pose health and safety risks because if those tubes leak or rupture, they could release radiation at levels that exceed safety standards. I'm pleased that the NRC has undertaken an investigation regarding the problems at San Onofre. Today, I want to make certain, and I will be asking all of you, I want to make certain that the Commission continues to pay serious attention to this nuclear facility. Let me be clear. It is your duty to ensure that the appropriate actions are taken to address safety concerns related to the compromised tubes before San Onofre's reactors are permitted to go back online. The San Onofre reactors must not be restarted until the NRC's investigation is completed and the public has been assured of the plant's safety. The NRC was created, and I quote, to ensure the safe use of radioactive materials while protecting people and the environment, unquote. And the millions of people who live near San Onofre deserve to have peace of mind. It is critical that the NRC conduct this investigation at San Onofre in an open and transparent way. I'm very pleased that the Commission has scheduled a public meeting in California in October. Today I want assurances that this meeting is on track and will take place. I also want to remind the Commissioners sitting here today about their commitments to me that the NRC will determine whether SoCal Edison was in full compliance with the regulations regarding the redesigned steam generators. We also need to evaluate whether the NRC regulation should be changed to avoid a similar situation in the future. I will continue to work with the NRC to ensure safety issues at San Onofre and other plants across the nation. And I do look forward to hearing from the commissioners about the progress that has been made to implement safety changes resulting from the lessons learned from Fukushima. Now I'm going to ask some questions that are related to the experience that we're going through in California with the shutdown of uh, San Onofre. Chair McFarland, the tubes on steam generators act as a barrier to the release of radioactivity that could endanger workers and the public if the tubes were to burst. Nuclear facilities have other systems that, if they fail, could also release radioactive material. Does the NRC automatically require a plant to amend its license if the plant makes a major structural change to one of these systems? Would you support the NRC examining whether plants should go through a license amendment process when they make such major structural changes to a plant? The NRC has a an oversight program that validates the day-to-day -day safety at the site. In terms of the steam generators, it's generally a licensee's business decision whether or not to change the generator. And I, I'll note that 55 out of 69 uh, pressurized water reactors in this country have actually changed their steam generators. Um, I guess my question... I, I know. Can, can I... Yeah, but because it's sort of two... The first question is, does the, does the NRC automatically require a plant to amend its license if the plant makes a major structural change to one of these systems? If uh, a steam generator is, is changed under our 5059 process, okay. we allow licensees to change their steam generators without a license amendment, as long as they assure us that they have not introduced any accident scenarios, additional different accident scenarios into the, um, into the system. Then we, and we don't do a design review okay. of the steam generator. Well, my concern is you have this plant that made this huge change, and it's, 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 it's led to a shutdown. So would you support the NRC examining whether plants should go through a license amendment process when they make such a major structural change? Because right now you've said you don't have to under your rules. Would you take a look at that, you and your fellow commissioners? I think we certainly 
uh, and the staff will certainly, def they usually do this kind of thing after a situation like this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we have at the San Onofre plant. We do reflect, and, and it won't happen right, way, right away. We have to continue through the process, but we will look and see what lessons we can learn from this and whether we do need to implement any changes. So we will consider this. Mm -hmm. Well, let me humbly suggest that this not be something that's put on the back burner, commissioners, because what's happening now in California is we've lost an important source of power, very important source. The community, and I have to compliment um, Commissioner Magwood when he said what happens when the community loses faith. We can't let that happen. And, and I'll tell you, it's been terrible on the utility. I mean, they feel terrible about what's happening, and they spent a fortune. How much did they spend? Do you remember it was hundreds of millions? Several hundred million dollars were spent, and there's a problem. So I would like to ask you to not give me an answer today, but at our next oversight hearing, I'm going to ask if you would consider examining the lessons learned already. We already know what happened. We already know that they didn't have to get uh, a new license to make structural change, and we already know what happened. And it was, it was terrible for the people in the community, it was terrible for the utility, and we still don't know exactly why this occurred, but I don't think you should wait in, in respect, I would say, out of concern for others in our nation, including the utilities themselves, the business people themselves, Everybody, because it's already clear that they should have had your expertise take a look at this change. Now, maybe they wouldn't have found anything. Maybe your great staff wouldn't have found it. But I have a lot of confidence in them, as you do, and you all do, that they might have said, just a minute, you know, this is a problem. Uh, so I, I'm going to ask you not now to commit to anything, because I want you to think about it. Maybe I'm being too cautious, but... I feel, or we know enough about San Onofre. How many months has it been closed down already? Since the beginning of the year. And this is, I forget the percent of power that comes out of it. It's not insignificant. It's pretty significant in the area. So we're missing that. 10% maybe. And nuclear is 20. So in that area, it could be as much as 10%. So this is serious business. And I think it underscores, you know, I would say on this committee, I'm one of the people that really is pressing hard every minute to make sure there's safety because I do agree with what Senator Alexander said for sure, that if people, he says every time we have a meeting, people get more confidence in you know, nuclear power. I would say if they were listening to this committee hearing, they would. I don't think it's true about all the meetings we've had in the past, but I think we're in a different ground now. We're in different leadership now. We're in a different circumstance here. I somehow feel we're all pulling for the same thing. This is important. And um, I just would like to see us not sit back when we've already had this problem in California. It's real. And uh, I hope you all of you talk about it at your next meeting when you talk to each other Maybe there's something you could put in place right now, an oversight review to see when somebody's making a real change that you get a, to have your good staff look at it. They may not catch a problem, but they may well catch a problem. So I think Commissioner Magwood really said something important before the House Energy and Commerce Committee in July. He was asked, um, What design and manufacturing flaws with San Onofre's steam generators were not detected, to de detected before the generators were turned on? And you said, quote, so when you have an outcome that's not satisfactory, you have to take a look at the process. And I think we should take a look at the process and see if there's something we can improve. And I appreciate that. And so I want to bring that to the chairman's attention because, you know, as you look at, because I didn't ask you today for your answer, but it seems to me you could avoid a lot of these problems if, when there's a major change to a plant before 
the utilities invest hundreds of millions of dollars, there, there really should be a, a, new, a new reg. So I hope you'll take a look at that, and we'll discuss it uh, the next time. Chair McFarlane, I, in my opening statement, I talked about the fact that there's an open meeting scheduled in the San Onofre community for October. Is that firm, and is that happening? And who, who do you expect will be there leading that uh, open process? Um, the meeting is set for October 9th. We are ironing out the final details of that. Um, and the, the way that the meeting will go, it will be in two parts. There will be a roundtable discussion with 10 or 12 uh, representatives from a variety of groups. And then there will, the second half will be um, a public comment period, public. Uh, okay. And who the commissioners will be there? The commissioners uh, will not be there. We will okay. have, uh, it will be facilitated by uh, two NRC staff people. There will be uh, the Region 4 Regional Administrator, uh, I believe, will be there. And um, there will be a representative from my office as well. Okay. I am very dedicated to ensuring that the agency communicates very well with the public. Okay. So who will brief all the commissioners about the results of that hearing? Who will do that? Whose responsibility would that be? The, the staff is responsible to do that. And okay. we will have either somebody from Region 4, the Region 4 office who was at the meeting come. Um, for example, yesterday the, re the regional administrator from Region 4 came by my office to give me the latest update okay. on the uh, San Onofre facility. So, and, and I asked him specifically what was going to happen at this meeting. So we are in very close communication okay. on this issue. So can I just ask the commissioners as a group, would you commit to being briefed uh, by the staff, all of you, uh, not to go, but to be briefed by the staff? Does everybody say yes, 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 good. Um, the other point I made in my opening statement is that I want to make sure that your investigation into the problems has been completed and that you are convinced that it is safe to, uh, to operate that plant. Do I have your commitment that that is your aim, that you will not restart that plant until you believe it is safe? Yes, absolutely. And that and all the commissioners, if any commissioner has a problem with the safety, that you will listen to those commissioners as well? Absolutely. Okay. Chair McFarland, in February, I wrote to the NRC about safety issues at San Onofre plant, including the rapid deterioration of tubes that carry radioactive water. I asked the NRC to comprehensively review and address safety concerns at the plant. In July, the NRC issued an interim report um, that you were augmenting inspection of the San Onofre plant. What is the NRC's understanding of the causes of the problems at San Onofre, and how will the NRC address all of the safety issues at the plant? The NRC is still working to understand the causes, and we are waiting for the licensee to respond to our confirmatory action letter. That Explain what you mean by confirmatory action. When these problems uh, occurred with the plant, um, we issued, in with agreement from the licensee, a confirmatory action letter saying that they would shut down the facility and work on understanding the root causes of this problem and then develop a way forward. Mm -hmm. And so we are awaiting their response to this letter where they tell us their understanding of the root causes of this problem. And they and have not sent such a letter? No, and we understand. In talking with the licensee, I talked with them two days ago. They came by and visited. They told me that they will be sending this letter by the end of the first week in October. Have you heard that they want to start up parts of this uh, plant? I understand that there are two reactors there, mm -hmm. Unit 2 and Unit 3. Uh -huh. I understand that Unit 3 uh, will likely be shut down for some time, unspecified. I know that they are, the licensee is planning to remove the fuel from the reactor at Unit 3 this month. So 
Unit 2 is the reactor that is in play at the moment and for which they will respond to the confirmatory action letter with a pl their explanation of what caused the problem with the steam generator tubes and a way forward. Hang on. It's our, my staff's understanding that two and three have similar problems. Is that your understanding? Yes, there are similar problems okay. with the tubes. One, uh, the tubes in three were, had more problems, more significant damage than the tubes in two. But is your understanding they have similar problems? Yes. Um, I'm assuming, because the, the rumors that we're hearing is that they plan to start up in October, but you haven't even gotten the letter back. No, 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 so, that's, that's not correct. So, unit, so you're, you can say unequivocally that Unit 2 is not going to be restarted by October. Oh, yes, absolutely. When we receive, let me, let me explain the process. When we receive that letter from them, then we will, it will take us some time. I can't tell you how long. It will be longer than days and weeks. It will be on the order of months okay. to understand whether they have understood well enough the root causes of the problem and to understand whether what their plan forward is, if it is going to provide the adequate safety. We will not let this plant start up unless we are absolutely convinced that it is safe to operate. Let me please assure you. Well, that is music to the ears of the people in California, and I'm very appreciative. Is there any dissension from that by commissioners? Well, that's, that's very important. Um, Chairman McFarland, the Union of... I'm sorry, did you, did you wish to comment? Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to add one comment. I agree with everything uh, Chairman McFarland said, but I wanted to highlight uh, this is a very complex technical problem. Yeah. And, and Terry Horner from your staff joined me on a visit to the plant July 22nd. We spent several hours there looking at uh, what they're trying to do to bracket this flow instability problem. And I just want to highlight, in, in echoing Chairman McFarland's response, this is a very complex problem. It's one that we've not seen before at plants in the United States, and it's one that's going to require significant NRC staff technical evaluation, uh, depending upon what the NRC receives from the licensee, but we don't know what that is at this stage. So it's yeah. Well, I so appreciate the caution here, and it makes me feel comfortable that you are doing everything to make sure this is safe. I, I, that's why I... I so believe that doing what Commissioner Magwood suggested in, for, in front of the House, that you take another look at your regulations, because what a shame that this money was invested in a way that would, turned out to be so wrong for the, for the plant, hundreds of millions of dollars. And that could have been, maybe, maybe it could have been uh, stopped had the NRC staff taken a look at this. We don't know all the details, but it's a puzzle. And, um, you know, again, as I think about everything that's happened since Fukushima, the, almost the irony of this situation, and I know that the mindset of the commissioners, I believe this today, is that this Culture of safety has to be the centerpiece of what you do before you restart this plant, and it just means everything. And I think at the end of the day, it's going to give confidence to people going forward. We all want the same thing. You know, we want safety first. And you do, I do, everybody does. Whether you love nuclear power, whether you hate wind power... <laughs>you know, wherever you're coming to, President Obama has an all-of-the-above strategy. So it's all got to be safe. And I think most people have an all-of-the-above strategy, and it all has to be safe. Whatever the, whether it's natural gas or nuclear, solar, or whatever. So thank you, thank you. I hope you feel, as I do, that we're all on the same page for now. May not always be, but we are now. My people in California are counting on you you stand in such an important place in their lives right now. I mean it, because I don't have the expertise that you are going to have on this California plan.
and I'm going to monitor the public meeting. My staff will be out there, and um, I really want to thank my staff and all the staffs here, both sides of the aisle, uh, for helping us get ready for today. And we stand in adjournment, and we'll I'm see you I'm talking to you today on Hiroshima Day about the question of human rights, science, and the law. And in this I'm representing a new committee called the International Committee on Nuclear Justice, which was launched in Vilnius uh, in December 2011, and later was added to by people from Geneva in May 2012. The purpose of this committee is to carry out and research um, legal avenues of preventing the continuing contamination of the environment by the nuclear industry and by weapons usage. And the first thing that, that we are launching today is um, a petition to the European Parliament which is based on human rights legislation and it's based on the fact that there is an enormous amount of information available now, uh, peer-reviewed literature, scientific papers, which show that the contamination of the environment is causing the deaths of millions of people. And up till now, nobody has really thought about ways in which they can legally stop the nuclear industry and the um, military from continuing to contaminate the environment, because whenever they try to do this, activists and NGOs, and there are enough of those, and I'm talking to you all now, they get blocked by the argument that the risk model, the International Commission on Radiological Protection risk model, shows that these contaminations are safe and cannot possibly harm anybody. But there is now enough evidence to show that this is wrong. Scientific evidence in the peer review literature. And in the document that I should be sending you, and which you can find on the website of the International Commi Committee on Nuclear Justice, which is nuclearjustice.org, you will find this document, which is a template for a petition to the European Parliament, which I will now explain. Now, this actually only applies to people who live in the states of the European Union. And later on, we will be dealing with people who live in other countries, like Japan and the United States, countries which have signed up to various international conventions on human rights. And we will be using human rights legislation. But for now, the first um, launch of this uh, Petition, this idea will be through a petition to the Petitions Committee of the European Parliament, which I will now explain. You will find this petition uh, on the website, as I said, of the International Commission on Nuclear Justice. And what I want you to do is to download the petition and to sign it. And if you like to add to it anything that you, you have that concerns you about the particular situation in your country, um, about nuclear industry, about contamination, possibly about child health, whatever it happens to be that, that is your concern, add that to the petition, sign it, and send it by registered post to the Petitions Committee of the European Parliament at Rouviers in Brussels, and we'll put the address up for you to do this. Now, I talked about this in Geneva, and I said there, when people were concerned about what could be done, that there was something that could be done. And if you all do this, it will cause a tsunami of petitions to appear. In August, and this is important because in August the, the European Parliament is in recess and, and these petitions will have to just build up in the Petitions Committee and they will have to deal with them. And the reason that they will have to deal with them is this, that the petition is based on the present European Parliament, the present, the present European law, which is a directive uh, uh, based on the Euratom Treaty it's the Euratom 9629 Directive, which is called the Basic Safety Standards Directive. Inside this directive is a clause, and I'll show you the clause here. It's, it's written down uh, under, under Chapter 5, Justification and Regulatory Control of Practices. And we're talking about practices involving the release of radioactivity to the environment. Article 20 says... Existing types of practices shall be reviewed as to their justification whenever new and important evidence about their efficacy or potential consequences is acquired. Now this is a terribly important clause because what it means is that all of the practices, that's every situation where radioactivity is released to the environment, has to be reconsidered on the basis of evidence that shows that the risk model that is currently being used to address this practice, and this is the risk model of the ICRP, 
if it shows that this risk model is wrong or raises questions about its safety, then these practices have to be re-justified. And this petition will force that to come about because it is law. So it's not just a question of complaining to your MP. It's not just a question of writing something saying, oh, I don't like this on some vast tsunami of postcards that go to somebody who just puts them in the bin. This is a legal process which has to be dealt with and they will have to deal with it. But only if you send the petition along. Now let me explain what this is about. Under, under um, international human rights agreements and legislations, there are various clauses which say that each person is entitled to live in an environment which is safe for their health. This has been universally signed up to by every single country in the world, and certainly by the European Union. Now the problem is that people who live in environments that in environments that are contaminated with radioactivity are not living in an environment which is safe for their health. And so this is a contravention of an international human rights legislation agreement. And the only reason that they can say this is, that the, this is the European Union, the Commission, in this particular case, that these things are harmless, is they can say that the International Commission on Radiological Protection says that, 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 these, that the doses that are associated with these exposures are too low to cause any effects. But in this petition, at the end of it, we have gathered together 55 peer-reviewed references, each of which, on its own, shows that the ICRP risk model is false. And not false by a very small amount, but false by a very, very large amount, so that thousands of people are dying, no, millions of people are dying as a result of these exposures. People are living along the shores of the Baltic Sea, people who are living along the shores of the Irish Sea, children who are leaving, living near nuclear installations. There's a long, long list. People in Iraq that have been exposed to radioactivity from uranium. I'll just go through a few of these because I don't want to hold you too long. The most important thing is this take-home message. You must get this petition, download it, and sign it and send it to the European Parliament at the address that we'll give you. So I'll just go briefly through some of the evidences, and they're all backed up by peer-reviewed studies. Firstly, there's childhood cancer near nuclear installations. An enormous number of studies have shown that if you live within five kilometers of a nuclear power station, your children have double the risk of getting childhood leukemia. There's no question about this. The radiation causes the childhood leukemia, and yet the ICRP risk model says that this is impossible. And the, the error in the model needed to account for these childhood leukemias, and the latest study is an enormous study from the German government. The error necessary to explain this is upwards of a thousand times. So in other words, the risk model of the RCRP is wrong by at least one thousand times in terms of it, it, with regard to this particular situation. And now also here's another thing. There was an increase in infant leukemia after Chernobyl in those children who were in the womb at the time of the Chernobyl radiation. So it could only be the Chernobyl radiation that caused the increase in infant leukemia. And the, these uh, uh, studies were done in a number of different epidemiological settings, in Greece, in Germany, in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in Belarus. Wherever anybody looked, they found increases in infant leukemia in these children who were in the womb. And that shows an error in the ICRP risk model of about 400 times. Then there was a study in northern Sweden by Martin Tondell uh, that showed that people who lived in areas contaminated with cesium from Chernobyl had, had cancer rates proportional to the amount of contamination. This was published in the peer review literature. It's there for anyone to see. It shows that the error in the ICRP risk model is about 600 times. A very important study now is one by Hagen Scherb in Germany and he looked at, the, and his colleague Christina Voigt looked at the sex ratio, that's the ratio of boys to girls who were born after particular accidents like Chernobyl, after the weapons testing fallout, and living near nuclear power stations. And he found that there was a perturbation in the sex ratio, quite clear, highly statistically significant, published in the peer review literature. It means that millions of children have died. Millions of children have died as a result of these exposures to, 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 to ionizing radiation. Shows another, that shows a problem with the ICRP risk model of 
hundreds of times, thousands of times. In fact, the ICRP risk model doesn't even consider the effects on, on, on infant mortality and, ch and children. So, we have cancer and, and leukemia, lymphoma and heart disease in uranium workers. Very recent study by Irina Gusevacano, in, in, who works for the French nuclear industry, incidentally. So not somebody from the, if you like, the lefty side, somebody who works for the industry. Very clever epidemiologists have studied uranium workers and shown that they have a huge increase in heart, heart disease effects and in cancer, in leukemia and lymphoma. This shows that the ICRP risk model is out by a factor of 2,400 times in the peer review literature. Various other things. I won't go through all of them. They're all on the end of this report. I, I'll just finally mention, of course, the work done by my colleague Alexey Yablokov, who collected together all of the information that came out from the ex-Soviet Union territories contaminated by Chernobyl and showed that there were enormous health disaster effects in, in Belarus, in uh, Ukraine, in, in those parts of the Russian Federation that were exposed to the Chernobyl effects in Bryansk. There is just so much evidence. We have an embarrassment of riches, but the problem is that nobody will look at it. Well, we're going to force them to look at it by sending this petition to the European Parliament Petitions Committee with all of its 55 references, and you are going to help us to do this by contacting us at info at nuclearjustice.org uh, or else co just going to the website and downloading the, the uh, information. And I hope that you will contact us and tell us that you're doing it. So we'll have a sort of a list of the number of people who have helped us in this way. For the first time, we can probably make a difference. We can probably really stop the nuclear industry from, for con, from continuing to pollute. And, and I don't blame these people. I have to say that we're, we're not talking about bad guys and good guys here, although actually there are some bad guys. I think in general we're talking about ignorance and uh, people who are tied into a sort of culture of physics and a culture of the past, a culture of a risk model that was set up in 1952 and hasn't really been altered since then. And so we have to forgive these people for what they've done. But we cannot continue to allow them to do it. Thank you.